Good morning, students. This morning we are going to learn one of the parts of your syllabus, and that is Virtues by Robert Frost. Frost is one of the better known American poets, and he. Uh, we are familiar with we are familiar with a number of his poems we have learned them in a, in the smaller classes like the poems like apple picking mending wall or mowing these are some of the poems that were stopping by woods on a snowy evening these are some of the poems of his that we have learned earlier now here is this particular poem verses this poem was written by him in the year 1915 and published in 1916 and when it was originally published the name that was given to this particular poem was swinging on bridges swinging on Birches was the original name. In 1916, when he published it, he gave it the name uh, "Swinging on Birches." And as we know, this particular poem, uh, uh, this is a better title or a more appropriate title uh, for this particular poem, "Swinging on Birches," than the one we have now. Purchase. Okay. Now, the, let's have a look at some of the qualities of this particular poet and, and how it fits in to uh, the background of this poem. Now, like uh, most, uh, uh, unlike most of the poets, he was like Wordsworth. He was the poet's for a lover of nature. He had a great affinity towards nature, and therefore we find his poems are uh, frequently uh, it uh, employs or it uh, settings from a rural setup, from a rural setup, and his uh, his settings for the poems are the rural life of New England. And that's a part of USA in early 20th century. Using and this particular rural life, he uses to examine the complex social and and philosophical themes. And why I say so is, though his poems start with a rural background in a rural life situation, we find that this. Basically derives uh, each of his poems. Basically derive a philosophy, uh, a, a theme, and that is very, very cleverly done. And now let us see what Robert Frost has said about uh, about poem poetry or poetry writing. So he said a poem should begin in a, a poem should. Poem begins in begins in the light and ends in wisdom. All right. A poem begins in the light and ends in the wisdom. Now this is basically the the pattern that he has followed in uh, most of his poems. When we read his poems, we understand how truly he adhered to it. He stuck to it. Uh, he starts with an ordinary ordinary uh, life situation, and from there he goes on to make a real life situation where you have a, a very wise. In coming out of it. Okay. Now, 
Now, when you look at this, uh, this particular poem, Virtues, basically it is about nature, about uh, virtues being a tree, a tree that is uh, easily bendable, a tree that is slim, rather slim, and therefore it is very pliable, so, it's, uh, so it can bend very easily. And one of the activities, activities uh, of the rural children in, in that part of, of USA, that's New England, was climbing up the uh, birch tree, which had uh, very pliable branches, or the wood of which was very pliable in nature. They would climb up the tree and swing on it and come down to the ground. So this was one of those activities that uh, the rural children uh, engaged themselves in. And now later on in the poem we will find he compares them with those uh, uh, city children who are used to playing baseball. But these rural children, they had no pastimes, no games, no sports. Their life was uh, mostly, mostly employed or utilized in herding their cows. And, uh, and the only, pa only uh, pastime they had was uh, being with nature. They were, uh, and uh, they would climb up the streets and then they swing down. And that was the game they enjoyed. They played. Alright? Unlike the children in the cities who played baseball and who needed partners. Baseball is a game with, uh, uh, and the team comprises of nine players and four bases you have. You have to complete the base then win the game. But here is a game in the rural setting where you do not require any, anybody else to be with you. You can play it by yourself, you can climb up a tree and then you can swing on it and then you, you come down and you do your work at the same time of looking after your father's cows. Alright. Then, but you find that this particular poem is a uh, uh, is not simply, I told you he is a nature lover, but this is not merely a rambling of a nature lover. But it's a quest, it is a quest to achieve a balance between two different worlds. The world of child and the world of adult. His childhood and his adulthood. So he is trying to find a balance between these two. That's what he is basically trying. He, he expresses his idea of virtues or birch trees as an extended metaphor. You know metaphor is a comparison. So it's a long drawn out comparison. Virtues in this is a, a, a elaborated or, or a long or extended comparison and he has a recurring motive. A motive is a theme that recurs. Recurs means occurs again and again. And what is the recurring motive in this? A lively lad. A lad full of energy and enthusiasm. And climbing up and swinging down on the branches of these birch trees. So he is basically trying to establish a balance between two worlds, the world of children, the world of adults, right, or the childhood and adulthood. And at the same time, for, for this purpose, he has employed a metaphor, an extended metaphor, and that is the birch trees or birches. And then he has a, a motive. I told you what is the motive. The motive is a theme or something that occurs again and again. And that is the picture of this lively lad climbing and swinging down on those birch trees. Alright? So, having said this, so these are the, the, the having said this, let us 
look at what are the things that that he uh, he, he is trying to tell us the the main thing that he finds is uh, the life of a life of a child is a carefree life but the life of an adult is quite different what is the life of an adult the, the adult's life is full of difficulties full of tensions and that is something that uh, he was trying to reconcile he was trying to to say strike a balance between the life of uh, uh, innocence life of purity led in the childhood versus the life of hardship and difficulties and pain that is the life of an adult now as we go through the poem we shall find that the poem is full of images we come across various images various symbolisms that are very wisely employed and some of those uh, imaginations uh, are uh, really really wild okay having said this uh, now the thing that we try to prove is or or the point proves is that what he has basically told us that a poem begins in the light and ends in the wisdom right so he has uh, started the poem with the delightful scene of a papa of a country lad climbing up and swinging on the branches of trees okay on what tree wood tree which is not which is uh, rather thin and very pliable in nature and therefore even you you swing on the tree it does not the branches do not break all right the moment you leave it it will go back to its uh, original position you come swinging down the tree to the ground and then you go up and when you go up you you are uh, uh, the tree goes back to its uh, own position let's look at the poem now. all right verses by robert frost when i see Birches bend to left and right across the lines of straighter, darker trees. I like to think some boys been swinging them, but swinging doesn't bend them down to stay as ice storms do. Often you must have seen them loaded with ice on a sunny winter morning after a rain. They click. on themselves as the breeze rises and turn many colored as the st- as the stir cracks and creases their lamber soon the sun swamp makes them shed crystal shells shattering and avalanching on the snow crust such heaps of broken glasses glass to sweep away you would think the inner dome of heaven had fallen they are dragged into the withered bracken by the load and they seem not to break though once they are bowed so low low for long they never right themselves you may see their trunks arching in the woods years afterwards trailing their leaves on the ground like girls on hands and knees that throw their hair before them over their heads to dry in the sun will will take up to that for the time being and uh, before we go further uh, you must have noticed the poem does not have uh, any stanzas or divisions all right so it is from the beginning to the end it proceeds without any stanza or break and then the next thing is the poem is written in what is called blank verse it's a 
It's a type of poetry that is employed uh, most of Shakespeare's uh, uh, dramas are written in a blank voice. Or, and this follows an iambic pandemic. Alright? It's a it's a measure, it's a measure of the poetry that we use as stress and stress, stress and stress. Such a recurrence five times in the line is called an army pentameter. Penta means five. So you have five meters, five divisions in a single line. So that's the pattern that he has followed in writing this. This is a written in blank words and uh, the uh, type as a form or of poetry, this would come under uh, the type, you can call it a narrative poem and uh, employing, employing a dramatic monologue. It's a narrative poem, it basically tells something. Narrative means to tell and it is basically telling us something. And the life of a rural child, a parent. So that is the obvious, uh, the, the superficial meaning of it. And then we have that. It's a dramatic monologue. And the, the, uh, in a drama what happens is we have what we call dialogue. What's a dialogue? Dialogue is a conversation between two individuals. A monologue, mono means single, whereas di means, di means two. Alright? So you have here a monologue, that is a person talking to himself. As if only we find only one person there, so what's that? Uh, he is apparently he presumes the presence of someone else. He presumes the presence of someone else already there. The same thing happens in another of his. Uh, the same thing is employed here in one of another of his poems, and that is uh, that is for instance uh, many one. The many one. There is another of his. Point where he employs this, this particular type of speech where he presumes there is another person standing next to him. Now the odd question in this painting wall is the question of having barriers between the properties of two individuals. And uh, so he is discussing it himself, but uh, he presumes another person is present there, as if another man is uh, by his side and he is talking to him. Right? But there is no presence of a second person there, but it is presumed. And this kind of dramatic monologue is also a common way of writing in this. <laughs>